Good evening everyone. We Kana and Anirudh on behalf of Road Room Open to Art and Design and the Loft Forum welcome all of you here for Vishnu Joshi Memorial Lecture 2020. I welcome Savita Tai Damdare, younger daughter of Sir VD Joshi who is here with us today and architect Ved Sagan from Mumbai who designed Prithvi Theater. And also architect Nachiket Patwardhan with whom Shabir sir worked before starting his own late vishnu devakar joshi papa ji as we fondly remember him was born on 14th of february 1927 he graduated from college of engineering pune 1948 batch he then joined mes and worked on nda project pune he later went to cambridge in england for post graduation in structural engineering after working in england for a few years He joined master architect Joseph Allen Stein's studio where he worked on landmark projects like American Embassy School, Escort Scooter Factory, IIC Delhi Auditorium, India Habitat Center, India International Center, Triveni Kala Sangam and Express Towers Mumbai. At the peak of his career with Stein in 1973 he thought of setting up a workshop for ferro cement his passion in pen near mumbai under the name of sarang ferrocrete and sea horse as symbol ferro cement was originally invented and patented by joseph louis lambert in uh, 1855 in france who first constructed a boat and exhibited at exposition universelle at paris ferro cement as construction technique was made popular in india by joshi sir he is a pioneer of ferro cement in india during his experiments in pen his wife malti tai become became a, a strong support both together continued to work for the next 14 years then he shifted to pune uh, the use of wood wool slabs concrete block construction technique now popularly known as vishnu padath or poor double masonry for village in uh, maharashtra and ferrogami taken from origami a word ma made popular by joshi sir for the for the art of ferro cement he worked on water tanks boats for fishermen grain store septic tanks and shelter for poor all this was near to his heart and kept on working on his belief that it is the most suitable technique for developing countries which could help in employ employability of unskilled labor architect narendra dengle from pune who worked with joshi sir on projects like shri ram krishna mandir and his studio his and house archaeological museum in shrinagar and workers club at deccan flora base first met this pipe smoking english gentleman in 1973 in new delhi he says i have known him to possess a very keen mind eager like a child seasoned like a very experienced engineer and uncompromisingly authoritative about his design which comes only from deep conviction his other known buildings using ferro cement are doshi hussain gufa in ahmedabad for uh, balakrishna doshi his own arunodaya complex in pune and 30 meter tall pyramid in narayan gaon for girish doshi triveni ashram at markal pune by arjun doshi is inspired by his teachings and built by his second generation adivasi team from pen after his demise in 2011 it was decided that in memory of this visionary st uh, structure engineer every year on valentines day which happens to be his birthday vd joshi memorial lecture will be held with that i take the opportunity uh, to introduce a project which was uh, an, a competition entry by uh, me anirudh and kana and it is called glass library so uh, the challenge the competition challenge was uh, to design a library in uh, a design a space limitation of 200 square meter and uh, the the prerequisite was that it it has to be in a site which is remotely located and uh, it it serves to the people who have you know lack of resources and lack of uh, uh, places where they can go and learn and read and basically it has to break the monotony of having uh, just the library and had have uh, more uh, like audio books more technology involved in it audio books e books uh, internet based computers and everything 
So this is the project summary. Can I will take you through it? So the project talks about uh, a tiny library that we were supposed to design, and we call it the glass library as that is the most eminent material that we have used. Um, so uh, at max, uh, there are 50 users that can be inculcated in the library space, and the area comes out to 200 meter square. So this is a view that actually shows how all the levels have uh, been taken into consideration, how the functions um, are uh, segregated. Also, um, the spaces, uh, they have... Uh, um, they they are uh, kept away from the cluttered uh, tiny library uh, spaces that usually we, found, uh, we uh, find, and visually the levels uh, are uh, uh, internally uh, connected, and there's a thin uh, channel-like um, tube uh, with water running through, which uh, keeps the uh, connectivity intact at all uh, times and places from wherever you are sitting in the library. So another key feature of the library is that uh, we've tried to use as many uh, materials uh, from the same context as possible. So the site happens to be in Bhuntar. Bhuntar is uh, up in Himachal Pradesh, and uh, it is like on the way when you when you're commuting from um, say. Uh, uh, Mandi, a, a, a city in uh, uh, Himachal itself, to Manali. So it lies in the foothills of uh, Parvati Valley. And uh, in Bhuntar is a place where basically two rivers, they come together. One is Parvati River and the other one is Bias River. So we have taken the banks of Parvati River to be our uh, site. And we've tried to use as much of uh, materials which are locally available, like pine wood, uh, which is the, the uh, prominent material in the entire library. And... Uh, the it it helps bring down the costs uh, of the construction over there and also it makes the structure to be a lightweight structure which helps in a, a, a terrain like this so about the um, uh, interior environment we we've tried to use glass on the out, outside on the uh, exterior on the facade of the uh, building because it uh, helps maintain and uh, you know keep the heat gain in, inside and uh, it helps you know retain the heat gain that 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 happens because of glass and um, there are we've tried to make, uh, break the uh, monotony of the tip, a typical library that you have and we've tried to made it make it more uh, open and ma make it more uh, open to the uh, surroundings also and in terms of visual connectivity also so uh, the atrium, the atrium is the key feature that our library holds. And uh, since uh, Bunda receives a lot of rainfall, uh, there is uh, on the top, if you see on the roof, there is a funnel-like uh, conic inverted conical uh, structure that we call the roof. And it seeps all the water and penetrates it down. And uh, that is how we do the groundwater recharge. There's a small diagram at the uh, bottom uh, left corner that shows how the entire thing is done. And uh, uh, the atrium, uh, uh, the atrium um, uh, t takes as much as uh, sunlight, diffused light, and it actually uh, does not uh, let any of the spaces inside the library get dim or dull. So this is uh, a render that we had taken out. Uh, this uh, talks about the skylight and. Uh, 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 the 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 fact that um, the central tube actually takes all the water down and seeps it through uh, the inside of the library. So this is a, a, a view corridor image, and that is an isometric um, uh, image showing the first floor uh, plan and uh, view. So here, the circulation also acts. As, so we have given shelves on um, the sides. So th the circulation is not is not only for transiting, or not is not just uh, um, you know defined to only uh, one use. Uh, one use. It also acts by functional. That is, uh, as you go up, you can use uh, all the books. You can uh, choose uh, from a variety of uh, books and magazines and. Uh, So we have irregular climbs, basically that that elongates the tread of the of the climb, uh, so as to you know have those spaces where you can uh, fetch a book from the shelf 
and maybe decide if you want to sit there on and read or not and uh, uh, th- th- these are like throughout the, the spiral like uh, circulation that is there in the in the um building and the circulation is further marked by these green patches which are there in inside these plans and the view so the third floor uh, corridor view it it happens to have a a, a conic uh, suspended from the top cocoon like private space where you can sit down and it has its own personal light f- which helps uh, a reader to basically concentrate on his own uh whatever reading material is going through and have a good amount of isolation as well as connection with with the outside uh world so in the end this is the sheet that we had submitted for uh, uh, uh again gla- uh, this tiny library competition which was organized by volume 0 and uh, the results have not been out yet so we, that's it thank you Uh so now there will be a small video of the baker card product by Rubai by Madhushala Rubai by Madhushala is all about remin- uh, reminiscing great works of architecture through a series of products these products narrate the story of architecture by symbolizing or via abstract interpretation of forms shapes details and other distinctive characteristics of architectural work it brings out the essence of architectural design to different techniques of expression and information about the work by creating interest and awareness for the user i hope you enjoy the video Oh, what a mango maniac baker was! Look at the geometry of his plants. Indeed, nothing less than the jali pattern. Oh, Jackass held my back. Can I join the game? that was indeed a very nice video so i would like to read a brief synopsis uh, about chabi sir um, on his behalf that he has written himself uh, graduated in 1986 from rachna sansad in mumbai after working for a couple of years in architecture offices in mumbai on we with staleness in the way architecture was practiced led me to the mountains of lonavala After shifting to Lonavala, worked with Nachiket and Jayu in Pune for a year. It's here. Besides architecture, I was exposed to movies and movie making. It was here that started my architectural journey, exploring at the intersection of the subtle art of storytelling in movies with the explicit art of architecture. uh good evening friends and students it's not just a pleasure 
but an honor to be invited to deliver vd joshi memorial lecture mr joshi was not just any other engineer he was a pioneer in ferrocrete in india and also someone who was passionate about his profession maybe profession is a wrong word it was a calling for him his commitment was such that he pushed the boundaries of knowledge and took it to the next level his use of ferrocrete boats for the fishermen of pain is a stuff of legends i thank my friend girish doshi and khushru irani for inviting me to give this prestigious talk it is in this context that i find it appropriate to talk about architecture in the backdrop of structure and and, and hence i have called this talk structure as a space making device architecture as a process has many facets in its creative pursuit such as functionality proportion geometry climatology culture art so on and so forth but for this talk i will speak only of how structure has been a subtext for all our designs and explain the process through the examples of buildings selected i will also show how one building is a trigger for another and that creative creative process is a creative process is a continuous process buildings are a conversation i will also share a couple of unbuilt projects which reinterprets buildings and role of technology in future so let me share my architectural journey whose bedrock has been the has been that the act of creation should not be the act of destruction and building should be as sustainable as possible contextual and timeless i will introduce the projects that i will be sharing with you and its general structural principles and then explain in detail project to project so i'll start uh, with the first project that i that i did it in my career as an independent architect and this is the house that i did in lonavla and it's made out of stone so we call it a stone house so i'm going to talk about 15 projects and the different principles that we've been using in it it's like what we learn in college you have load bearing structures you have rcc frame structures we have tensile structures so how we been playing around with structural principles and using it as a space making device cantilever and tensile structures and technology driven structures so inside load bearing we have four different structures so cantilever and tensile and technology driven so these we have something like 15 structures um i'll try and make it as fast as possible because the time is limited i have something like 460 slides so this is the stone house that i spoke about so this is the very first project that we did and it's a load bearing structure the stone that came from the building was from the site itself so the site was kind of ravaged because uh, the guy from whom they bought the property my client used to take away the soil and after taking away the soil he would leave the boulders over there because he couldn't lift it up so when the client bought the property and he showed me the site it was like a moonscape and it just had all these huge boulders so i decided to make this house out of the stones that came from the soil itself and decided that the best thing to do with a stone is make arch out of it it's like what louis kahn said i asked a brick what it wanted and it said it wanted to be an arch so i asked the stone what it wanted and again like a brick it said it wanted to be an arch so it's a arch houses now these arches are pretty large you know these arches are something like 21 to 22 feet and it's a segmental arch so when you have a arch like that it puts tremendous pressure because it wants the gravity is acting on it so it wants to straighten out 
So what you do is you give her flying buttresses. But what I did was I manipulated the form so you get flying buttresses only on the one side and the other side I took a curved wall. The moment you take a curved wall you don't need a flying buttress over there. So it's very interesting how you can manipulate the forces and do something that you wanted to do. So this is that house. So this is the, you can see that curved wall which is the fireplace over there. And there's an arch over there. So these are these large arches with the flying buttresses. And again, I've, I used to be on a trip that how to do more with less. I still am on the trip. So what I did was, and in this building, there was no structural consultant, anybody. So I was designing the buildings myself. And uh, so then I thought about how to do the roof. And normally, if you talk to any structural engineer, he'll say you need two and a half to three kilos per square foot to do a roof. This is not an RCC roof. It's a asbestos roof with the manglo tiles on it. So I said, okay, how do we do it with less? So what I did was, you'll see it in the photographs, I did a built-up section. And the built-up section is like, the smallest angle available is one inch, and the smallest bar that is available is six mm. So I took these two things and did a built-up section. So the weight of my structure, the structural steel, is like 0.6 to 0.7 kilo per square foot. So this was a kind of the land. It's still like this. It's just full of these potholes because the raw soil is gone and there's nothing over there. So this is a kind of land I got it. So this is the entry. I used to be bugged in those days that, you know, your transition, the transition like a door is always two-dimensional. It's like you open the door, one, one second you're inside and the other second you're outside. So how do you make the transition prolonged a little bit? So what I designed was a, a, not on a flat wall, but where two planes meet, you have a door happening over there. So then you get these very interesting kind of a door that happens. It's like a clasp. So this is a photo from the inside. So this is the entrance vestibule. So left hand side is a dining kitchen and the right hand side is a living space. So now these are the huge arches. And you can see that curved arch over there. The arch goes and rests over there. So this is the one. Can you see this? So if you... So this arch is going and resting on the arch. And that was a very tricky thing. And imagine that I didn't have an engineer, I had nobody to fall back on. And so that's another story which I'll share it with you some other time. But it was fantastic, you know, because you're learning on the job. This is the first time you're doing something like this. And in this project, I happened to be the contractor myself. So it was like a design build. So I was completely responsible, not only for designing, but executing it. You can see the structure, it's extremely slender. It's like one inch angle and one six mm simple bar. So these are the flying buttresses that go outside.
So what happened was, you know, um, stone as a material, like brick, is digital. So when you when you make structures out of it, it's a digital mode. When you make a structure out of concrete, it's analogous because it flows. You know, here you take one piece at a time and you build it like a brick and stone. So that's that's a that's a materiality that you're using. And once you realize it, when you're really doing it yourself, you understand the material so much better. So while the work was going on, the guy who was doing the mason who was doing the work, you see this line. So he was bringing the stone work, this and bringing another. So the line that I was getting was completely like random it was. So I told him nothing doing. So then each stone is each stone is actually done like an obtuse angle. And if you look at the front part, they're all acute angle. Now this is something that you can do with a stone. Yeah? Now this is you can't do it with a brick. Yeah? So material also dictates the details of your building. And the more you get intimate with the material, your detailing is that much better. So this is a bed. So we designed the furniture also. And you know, most of us have a habit of before we go to sleep, we want to read something. And then we take a pillow and we try to make ourselves comfortable. So I said, okay, let's design a bed where you have an option that you have a backrest. Okay? So you see these handles? You can turn around and it comes out. You put your pillow and it's perfect, you know. It's ergonomics. And then when you want to sleep, you just turn it around. It's a bathroom. It's not a typical bathroom bathroom. It has no tiles. It's just exposed concrete. When you see the other bathroom also, it's again not a, out of a textbook. So here you can see it's a stone and China mosaic. And the shower is just one large slab of granite. You know the fun part that architecture is a lot of times you discover things because we are not omnipotent. So we do not understand a lot of things that happens over there and it's fantastic. So when these flying buttresses, when you walk from inside and you keep looking at the arch of the flying buttress, your view is very, it's dynamic. It's not static. Because when you are seeing from inside, you're looking at this angle. Then you walk through, then you're looking straight. And then you walk through, then you're looking at a different direction. And it's amazing, you know. You look at a window, normally the view is very, it's frozen. Because that's the whole idea. But when you have something like this, then it's not frozen. It's extremely dynamic. You can see this mountain. So this is what happens, you know. They remove the soil out of mountain and they sell it and the mountains are just left like that. And it's extremely sad to see a beautiful landscape being ravaged like this. Okay, the second one that I'm going to show is a school, St. Joseph School. This was done sometimes in 1996. And again, it's a load-bearing structure. But here what one tried to do was, you design a wall. It's like designing a plane. You design a plane and you take it for a walk and the volume start happening. So I designed just one wall. So this is in 96, material is brick, arches, flying buttresses. So this is the design team. You know, we as a profession, without a good team, it's not 
possible to practice architecture. Also, without a right client, you can't do because otherwise you live in the in the realm of ideas and nothing gets executed. But also, part of the important thing is that you require good people to execute your ideas, and that's what you learn. That because the moment you're trying to push the boundaries, you need the right people to execute it for you. And I'll show you uh, the other projects also that how important it is to have a good contractor. So this is a, bu a building. This is in the heart of Lunavla. So this is the wall that we designed. Again, it's a large arch. This is again a buttress, but this becomes a corridor. And this is a flying buttress on the outside. So as I said, you take a wall for a walk. So it's as simple as that. You make a wall, put it at a grid, and spaces start happening. So these becomes a classroom. So this is a very interesting. This is the entry. It's always because it's a square. How do you enter a square? When you start designing and you start getting into it, how do you puncture? It's always so difficult. How do you, whether you go straight, whether you go diagonal, whether you go from the side, it's always a challenge. And out of those challenges, your solutions get more interesting. So this is a plan. So you have a courtyard over here. This is the entry. This is an office. I think there's a staircase over here, and these are the classrooms. And this is a toilet block. So this is the entry. Yeah. <laughs> so this kushru was a gift to my elder son because he was joining school and this is the school I made it for him in 96. <laughs> so it's a father's gift to his son. So these are the classrooms. You get this beautiful quality of light, you know. It's very nice. I don't know what the calendar is doing there. Okay, this is the house that it's almost completed. But I'm going to show it to you. These are, this is in Chennai. And it's one of the most complicated arcade that we have created. This is a courtyard for this house in Chennai. And there are these arches made out of laterite. And it's a true arches. The arches are 25 feet tall. But the whole arcade is extremely... I'll show it to you how... It's fun, you know, because... When you start playing and start enjoying architecture and getting into the details, and the complexity is not for the reason of a complexity, but you need a lead motive in your design, which you carry on till its logical conclusion. You know, so you do you take an idea, push it, and see what happens. And this is we have taken this. Uh, uh, Within this arch, this uh, right house, we call it a right house. This is more like a tribute to Frank Lloyd Wright. So the client got confused. He didn't know who Frank Lloyd Wright is. And we would write right house all the time. So one day, he sheepishly asked me, he said, who's right? He says, my name is Ravi. <laughs> who's, who's right? I said, there's a famous architect called Frank Lloyd Wright. And trust me. 
within a week somebody gifted him a book of frank lloyd wright all the houses like this thick a bible so next time when he goes when i go to chennai so i normally go to his house and have breakfast with him he says he says you won't believe somebody gifted me this book of frank lloyd wright and he said i said see this it's like what do you call it destiny yeah okay so this is it's still not complete so some of the photographs are still you can see the exterior the work is going on so we got a lot of features of frank lloyd wright like you know all his chajjas would have a cutouts like this because it gets the light in it's beautiful so this is a team that worked on the project a plan and i approached i told uh, ravi that we will uh, for the landscape i wa i wanted somebody because landscape is it's more than 50% of your design depends on the landscape that you can get otherwise it can kill your building so i said let's get shaker james shaker james is considered to be the father of landscaping in india he's fantastic and he doesn't do small jobs he doesn't do houses at all he does infosys campus he does 100 acres of resorts and all those kind of stuff so i sheepishly gave a call to his office and i said i want to meet mr baker uh, mr shaker he says okay and i took all my designs and renders and everything and i said uh, mr james i want you to do this um, landscape so he saw the arches he says okay it's only because of the arches i'll do this project so he is doing the landscaping for it okay so we have this central courtyard you know architecture happens at the interstices what louis kahn would call as a servant space i find that these are the spaces that you can really do something that is magical yeah so this is interstice space with between the served area and this is servant space because it's a courtyard it's not a habitable room room so these are these um, laterite arches so it's elliptical in shape now what happens is we said okay we take this curve you see the dotted one and that becomes your guiding for everything that happens within that space so now you take this curve and you put it over here it's the same curve okay then there are arches happening at the sides so this is one part of the building this carved out you see these arches now this arch and this arch is the lowest you join this to the top you get the same curve that is at the bottom okay now the fun still happens if the arch is on the top now you take a section like this this is part of the same curve so you have these kind of lot of complexity because then you know otherwise what happens is you keep on jumping from ideas to ideas you do not get a symphony you get a cacophony the lot of ideas over there but there's nothing to hold it so there should be one idea that holds or there should be one curve or one thing that's holding all your different ideas and different elements that's a bridge and the second part and this is the second part of the house and that's a skylight on the top so you see this arch these are the it's a dining area that's a living space there are these two bedrooms with the terraces over there
let's say main door this is inside that's your space you can see this thing going in curve you know that's a view from the top <laughs> so this is from the bridge you're seeing it complete panoramic so you see the outside and you see the skylight and you come down I'm gonna show the fourth one this is a ferrocrete thing this is in uh, the resort that we have done called Amanzi it's at Pauna Dam it's a very small property, three acres, and uh, it's a contoured site because it's on the hill. So this is an underground, so that's it's called cocoon, you know. And the, sh uh, the form that we took is a paraboloid, you know. You take a parabola, and the cross-section is also a parabola. It's like an egg. You take a section of an egg, that's what it is. Because it becomes extremely strong and um, because it's underground and the soil on the top so it has to be strong it's ferrocrete because that's the only way to make it and it's just two inches or three inches thick and it's the biggest one that's around 10 meters of the big the bigger side is 10 meter wide which is quite huge That's a team that worked on it. So this is a plan. So, so you enter from here. This is a mothership. Uh, that's a landscape. That's a. Then you have these cottages over here, and uh, we have a dining somewhere over here. And this is a cocoon because the, the it's sloping like this, and this is not to come in the sight lines of this cottage. It's underground.
forms are so important because the material that you use you should take a form that does justice to it, you know. Because if one is going to use a ferrocrete, then the shell is the best thing to do. And it's like mind-bogglingly strong, you know. So imagine just a three inches of thickness of a shell is able to take this cocoon that we made, tons of soil that is put on top of it. It's, it's fantastic. How do I play it? Yeah. So this is the parabola and in the section also it's a parabola. So this is where the structure is. That's a plan of it. You see these two like a Shrek, things coming out. So what we've done is we put mirror inside. So it gets fantastic. The light filters in and this just gets reflected. So this is the, the toilet over here. And the other one is for the walk-in wardrobe. So this is the making of it. This is completed. It's the interior of it. So we made the sky lights also out of ferrocrete. That's a bathroom. You can see the light coming from here. That's overlooking the lake. That's a kind of a view you get from there. I'm going to show the Machan. Machan is one of the first buildings that we did with steel. It's in a forest, which is like 25 acres of forest. And this is like, it's a serious forest. You know, it's like uh, they have a barking deer that stays within the property. They have all kind of flora and fauna. They have a naturalist who comes every six months, mostly from abroad. And they do the study of the flora and fauna. They found some species of frogs that were not documented in India. And then they made a presentation to the, the forest department and gave them all the photographs. And the habit, they studied the habits of the flora and fauna, which is found on that property. So when the client came to us and wanted to make a house, they wanted a normal kind of a house. And that didn't make any sense, you know, because they, they got a part of a land which is kind of flattish. And uh, so it didn't make any sense. So I said, let's do a tree house. So he said, give me a week. After a week, he agreed that, yes, we'll do a tree house. He used to make a machan. On the, uh, there was this uh, wild fig tree, which is considered holy in this part of the country. And he says, I make a machan over there. He had made a bamboo machan. He said, look at that spot, and if it's okay with you, we'll make it over there. So this is the first machan that happened. Uh, he calls it a heritage machan. So, and the whole idea was, the condition that he gave is, forget about cutting trees. You can't even break a leaf out of my trees, because it was so dear to him. And in, in 2006 or 2007, he had nurtured it for 17 years. So for him, it was extremely important. And uh, I said, fair enough. It's a challenge, you know. So the whole structure is designed in a way not to cut any tree, not to cut even a branch, not to cut even a, a leaf. So the idea that we came up was, because you can't even take a, you can't take a truck over there. Everything has to be done manually. So we said, okay, we will make this house in Pune with a nut pole structure, and then take it to the site and assemble it over there. So that's what we did. It's one of those houses which is like 90% recyclable in the sense you can take this and dismantle, take it anywhere. 
there is no rcc use except for the uh, for the footings the rest of the th structure is made out of steel wood and bamboo uh, steel wood and glass so these are the three materials that we used in fact it was selected by cnn in 2007 or 2008 as a 23 ideas for the sustainable future so i'm going to share this with you because this is uh, if you know about Len Merkert, who's a great Australian architect, and he talks about that your building should touch the earth softly. You know, it should be just touching at the points. And this is exactly that. So we got a complete series of uh, structures which just touch the earth extremely softly. So this is a girl who worked on the project. So this is a master plan. This is the heritage machan, the first one, then the others will follow. The whole idea, if you look at a tree, it's an inverted pyramid. So the whole idea was that you make your structure like a tree. So you have a tree, the natural tree and the house will be around it with a courtyard in the center and everything branching out. So it's an inverted pyramid. The house is like an inverted pyramid. So this is a crow's nest. In the ships, they have the highest point. It's called a crow's nest. So the client was, he wanted a crow's nest, and which is fantastic because suddenly you, this is a very vertical house. You know, you have these horizontal houses. The, the stone house is very horizontal. This is a vertical house. And having that crow's nest accentuates the verticality of the house. So this is a forest over there. So this is the tree, and the house happens around it. So this is a sleeping balcony. This was supposed to be his own house. So um, the good thing about second homes is you can take a lot of liberties. There's no Vastu guy. There's no <laughs> real considerations. This is the way my... Our family life works. People are pretty casual about it. They allow you to do most of the st stuff that you want to do. This is a hanging room. It's a roof plan with a crow's nest. So this point is 45 feet from the forest floor. So you can imagine this. And the flooring is just wood. There's nothing. There's a steel girders. You put a thick clear, thick piece of wood that's your flooring. You know? And the roofing is mango tiles. Wherever we wanted a wall for the toilet and all, we just took the stones on a T section and put it over there. So all the walls are also stone. So everything is like there's no brickwork, there's no plaster, it's dry construction. So there are these four columns, one, two, three, and four, and the whole house is happening. These are all the brackets that are supporting the cantilever. This is looking from the courtyard. So you approach it through a ramp. So it got a lot of uh, aesthetics of a ship. A 
Like we did a drawbridge, so in the night you can just close it and then. And it was supposed it's in a forest, so you do not want wild animals to get inside. This is from the inside. You entered, and that's your tree. You can see the branch going inside. So this is a house done by Frank Gehry. I think it's Frank Gehry, yeah? or Peter Eisenman, where there's a, there's a dining table and there's a column off center of the dining table. And then he says that the column comes to dine. So I say the, the tree comes inside for a shade. So this is looking outside. You know, the architecture, for when you have such beautiful nature, your architecture is incidental. You want to take a back seat as much as possible and not let your ego take over to say that, oh, I can do that. So when you're inside the house, it's just you and nature and the building just disappears. So this, again, we got it from the, you know, you have these people who sell the, the ship. When they break the ship, a lot of stuff is sold. So this is a shipping deck. So instead of putting a glass, we said, okay, let's put a, a ship deck. You can see through the, the holes to the floor of the forest. So now you go down to the hanging room. This room is literally hanging. It's not supported by anything. From the top, it is suspended. Then you have a room that goes up. That's a sleeping balcony. This is a view from the sleeping balcony. This is a view from the crow's nest. That's the location. Okay, the second one that we take is a forest machan. So the forest machan, it's again over there. That's after we completed, then we did a camp canopy, and then we did a forest machan. So as I said, buildings are a conversation. Yeah? So the same thing, the, the, the design was triggered from the heritage machan. That's the location. So this is my heritage machan. These are the forest machan. Okay, so I'll just show the evolution. You carry on the brackets. You remove the columns, those four columns. And it's practically a inverted pyramid. Yeah? So it comes to a point. So this is a pod. This is one room that's another room. So you have two rooms next to each other. And then on the first floor, so you have this. And then the first floor, the room is 90 degrees to that. So you have three rooms. So this is like this pod can have, has three rooms into it.
So this approach, it's through the forest, you know. Again, it's a dry construction. Can you see the structure? That's your pyramid. So it comes to a point and this whole thing goes up. Now I'll show the eagle's nest. This is in Pauna. Now again the trigger for the design of this, the structural trigger, I'll show the evolution of this. So that's a team that worked on it. So from Forest Machan, So you remove these things. <coughs> that becomes the spine of the building. <coughs> so this is a lake. Now the building is responding to the lake, the views of the lake. How do you frame the best view of the lake? On the opposite side is a beautiful mountain, uh, and there's a fort over there, Tungi Fort. So you're, you're right on the axis. But this side of the lake is fantastic. You get the island view. Now, if you will see most of these structures that we do, they have a minimum point of contact to the earth. So what happens is uh, you do not dig, you do not change the course of the water, you do not hurt the flora and the fauna that grows on it. Your intervention is extremely minimum. So this is something like 2,500 square feet where we, will, we were able to build with something like Four columns. Now, four columns are 2,500. Is If you look at it, a 10 by 10 room requires four columns. So if you have 2,500, you require minimum around 15 to 20 columns. So you reduce so much of digging on the ground and, and destabilizing the whole mountain. So this is, a, this is the main spine. And from the spine, the support happens. And that's a titanic deck on the top. So you have a living room, a bedroom, bedroom, games area, library, and extra bedroom. So this side is something like 35 feet from the ground. And over there, it's like 5 to 6 feet. So this is an entrance vestibule. This is a kind of a Zen window. It just frames the lake. It's a small triangular window. You come and... If you guys have read about pattern language, Christopher Alexander, he talks about this Buddhist temple in, uh, near Mount Fuji. And while climbing the, you go into the temple, you're climbing the steps, and suddenly you see this Mount Fuji framed, and it's in transition. And then you take a turn around. So it's not your destination, but it frames a Fuji. He calls it a Zen window. So this is kind of a Zen window. You, it frames the fort over there, 
and then you go into your living room or the other spaces. See this, you're bang on the axis. That's going up to the Titanic deck. So, this is structure. Okay, now this is a very interesting one. This is taking its form from the arches, but it's a steel arch. And uh, it's not just in one plane, but it's in two planes, and they come and meet in the center. So we call it a castle steel. It, it got aesthetics of a castle, you know, with the turrets and everything. But again, this is in Karakwasla. It's again on a mountain. And this whole house is just supported on four columns. So that's a design team that worked on it. So you see these arch? They come in the center. And it's a steel arch and it's a built up section. So it's extremely complex to do something. And the, the guys who did this job, you will not believe, they're not big companies or anything. These are some really humble people, but they do amazing work. And honestly, I thought that this is not buildable because I didn't know where to get a fabricator who can do such a precise job that you have these things coming and meeting in the center. But this guy pulled it off, you know, some unknown guy in Pune. And I say that our country has so much of talent and it just gets wasted because they're doing routine work when they are capable of doing so much better. This is 60 feet. Imagine 60 feet. This whole bungalow is exactly 100 feet. And from both the sides, it gets cantilevered by 20, 20 feet. So this is a living room. This is like 60 feet long living room, bedroom, bedroom. And there's an open kitchen over here. You can see it. Little store, toilets, toilets. So this, you come, you turn around, and there's a ramp over here that brings you inside. See these arches. That's a view from the bedrooms. You can see Karakwasla Lake. There's a forest. This is a view from the other bedroom. This is a view from the living room. There's again a deck which is suspended. can see this road going up. So that was that. Now we'll go back to Canopy Machan. This is a completely a tensile structure. Again, there's a forest. And where we wanted to build, the forest was going down. The, the ground was going suddenly straight down. 
So the whole idea was, and these were supposed to be tents and we wanted to make it floating. So we have just these two columns and the whole structure gets suspended. So what you have is tensile cable, spin joint and two column structure. It's Roy to work on it. So this is the way. You know what happens is when you have it unequal, whenever you go back home, look up Pompidou Center, which is uh, Richard Rogers and Renzo Piano. And in that, each floor, the beam, there's a pin joint and there's a tensile cable that holds it back. So that's an extremely efficient way of designing that you're able to do so much more with so less, you know. So this idea is that there's a pin joint, this wants to go down, you just hold it back. So with just 20 mm cable, you're supporting this huge structure. So you make a platform and the tents happen on top of it. So this is during the construction stage. That's a toilet that we created. That's a client, Huja and his wife. You go up. It's humongous, you know, it's just like more than 35, 40 feet in the air. So this is it, you know, it just floats in the air. So how, the whole idea is that how do you make structures, use structural designs to create spaces, you know? So what is the subtext? So this is the kind of subtext that I wanted to share with you because the nature of the talk that we have. Now, this one, after that it's eye on the lake, this was happening simultaneously. I'll, as I said that buildings are a conversation, so how one form triggers another form. Okay, so from camp canopy, this form evolved. You just mirror the same profile. You get your... It's just a room, nothing else. It's nine acres of land, Kharakwasla touching the lake. And it was more like a day picnic she wanted to do with her children because she had spent her childhood doing the same thing. And um, she herself is an architect, but after seeing Machan, she said, you should do this for me. And it's a great honor because when an architect asks another architect to design, it's that much of more respect that you're getting because a client comes and gives you a job, it's a different matter. But when an architect does that, it's very different. So the, the point that happens is when you build in something which is, with this nature all around. So how do you, how do you strategize what's important but not losing the other part of it? So it's just a glass house. But the front part is fantastic. The side is also good. But that's not what you want to highlight. So that's how we put the 
wooden slats. It's almost like a, the blinkers of the horse that you see it in front. But still you can see from the sides. So you'll see from inside that how it works. So this is just sitting on two points, you know. It's, it's like a bird on the edge of a lake. It's like that. The house is like that. I had heard an interview of Glenn Merkert on BBC once and, and he said something very sensitive. He said, your buildings should be fragile but not, not weak, you know. It should be fragile. So it's, it's an extremely fragile structure that way. You know, the best part about these kind of structures Normally, you would not, never be able to experience the bottom of the building. Yeah? So here, they become very nice spaces. So this is from the inside. And the shadows are fantastic, you know. So that's a little... Love for a son who was very small at that time, three or four years. See, that's a skin. That's a wooden skin and there's a glass skin. Given a catwalk, because maintenance is issue, how do you clean a glass? So then, architecturally also you have to look at the maintenance part about it. This is a glass house. This is a Nasik. Now, this is interesting because, again, as I said, that all these structures have a pedigree. I mean, this, the ideas are coming from somewhere. Now, in this case, this is like a machan, cantilevered on three sides, but the roof is suspended like camp canopy. So the roof is not the load is not going onto the walls or the structure. It's free floating, suspended from the top. So now we're trying to make buildings as extremely efficient as possible because normally the roof load would go onto the columns and it will go onto the this thing here. It's not happening. It's just being taken from these four columns. So it's a T plan. Again, it's in a forest, you know. You know, there's a reason, if you notice in Machan also, the glass was sloping out. When you build in a places in nature and you put glass, the worry is that the birds come and hit into it because they can't realize that there's a glass. And you have a lot of deaths happening because of these birds coming and hitting the glass. The moment you put it at an angle, the birds are able to sense that there is a glass and they don't come in it. So there's not been a single hit on the machan, even though it's right in the forest. And the second thing that happens, which is not the primary, but the secondary, in the night, it does not look like a barber shop. It doesn't just reflect your reflection, you know. So that's something good. So here also, yeah, so this is a video. That's holding back the roof. I'll come to the bridge on the pond. This is again in Machan. 
So, Machan has a major problem. It doesn't have any source of water. So the client had made all these ponds and the water would percolate down. So there were these kind of big holes in the ground and no water. So he wanted to make a, a small conference come Bankway Hall. And so I told him that's an ideal location because it's useless. So the whole idea was like a bridge. And on the bridge, the structure happens. So your reason is the bridge, you're going from one point to another point. But in between, this thing happened. It's very interesting. You know, if you look at uh, Michael Graves, one of his structures is fantastic. It's a bridge, and that's where the museum is. And he won the competition for it. If you go back to Jaunpur, you look at a bridge done by the Mughals. They had shops on it. And it's one of the most beautiful bridges. So it's a nice thing that you have a bridge, and things happen on it. So you're just going from point one to point B, and things happen. And he also wanted, because they didn't have a dining space, so he wanted to have a dining space. Uh, in the rainy season, they couldn't sit outside. So this is where the structure is. So that's a... So we made this three columns, and these are castellated beams. This is like 75 feet. And then we just give brackets on it to reduce the span of the, the central spine. Now the view that was happening was also happened to be the rain side. And when it rains in Lonavla, it's the wind which is a problem. You know, it just lashes. So you need at least minimum of five feet of overhangs to protect it. So what was happening is this is a view side. There's a beautiful mountain over here. And I needed to protect it. So the building starts responding to the climate. So that's a dining space. So this is a conference come Bankway, and these are the open spaces. This is the bridge, and these are the steps. And the ground underneath is a was a, is a dry pond. So you go through this forest. So this is the dining area. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll come to the last of the series of uh, this thing. This is a waterfall house. It's again a bridge because you're a waterfall. You're going from one point to another point. But you're not going straight. You're going 45 degrees out and 45 degrees in. The whole idea was, so the house is floating. This has just got completed like a month back. <coughs> so the idea is that when you see the water, you're looking at the waterfall at the eye level. So the whole house is lifted up by 65 feet from the floor of the, the waterfall. It's a balanced cantilever because you have 40 feet behind and you have 40 feet in front. So this is a site. Now again, the challenge over here is you enter somewhere over here. Can you see this? This is the entry. And this is like 100 feet up. From the gate, it's 100 feet up. There's no way to make a road, nothing. So again, it's, it's a process to make a... And this is honestly possible to do something like this only in India because here yeah, the labor is cheap. 
If you were to imagine this kind of a design in a first world country, forget it. You can't build it. Because there's no way to make a road. If you don't have a road, how do you shift the material? So it's great to be an architect in India, trust me. You know, we can we can do a lot of things, we can get away with a lot of things. So these are the construction photographs. This is an aviary. So he's a avid collector of birds, and he got some of the most beautiful birds. So you get a sense of scale. So this is a bridge that is joining the two wings. I'll show you the, the making of this, you know. Okay, now I'm going to show two structures that are not built. We worked on it for two real clients, but the clients are not ready for it. Okay, so one is this friend of mine who stays in Canada, and uh, and he's he's crazy, you know, because he's a avid uh, stargazer. Avid means avid that every year. He comes to India for one month to do stargazing. Because he stays in Canada, so what you get is a northern sky. And the northern sky is completely different from the southern sky. What we get is a southern sky. So he comes to India. Also, he's into popularizing stargazing to school children. So he has these uh, school camps and all that happens. So he asked me to design this building because, uh, and it's, you know, the thing is about in a big city, you don't see the stars because there's so much of light from the city that the skies are, the stars disappear. So if you really want to do stargazing, you have to go outside really far away from a big city to see the, you can see the Milky Way then, you know. So this, he bought a place in God forsaken place where you can't build anything, you know. So I told him, listen, you can't build anything traditionally. And there's no way I can go and, uh, uh, what do you call, supervise it. It's impossible because I just don't have that much of time to go in the middle of nowhere to supervise. So I told him that let's take a containers and make this thing out of container. The thing that was happening was that 
the building was facing the south side and because it's in the middle of nowhere you get a terrific amount of glare and no matter you do anything you can't take away the glare until you have like 8 to 10 feet of overhangs so i said okay we take a container and we make a mobile the container comes out and the container is a bedroom so i'll show this to you it's a very interesting and this is possible now with the technology that we have you know the whole idea i don't know if you guys know about a a great sculptor called calder look him up he's very interesting calder is the one who started doing sculptures at a mobile you know normally you would look at a sculpture which is static you see it you walk around he started doing these sculptures which are mobile architecture is entering the phase of where you can do what you can imagine but it should not be a gimmick you don't do things for the sake of doing because you can do it you know so but it's possible wherever we want to do something we can pull it off so this is a container house so that's a plan so you have two containers 8 feet by 20 feet so this is a day mode yeah it goes out the container it becomes a chhajja for the living room which is below and the night boat it comes back to its place so i'll play the video for you these are the views so these are containers you know it's come out it's giving the shade to the living room which is below in the night it goes back and the top portion is where he wanted to do the stargazing he needed a height he wanted a height because there was a mountain in front of it it was not a mountain it was kind of a hillock so you needed a height to see the sky's maximum otherwise it could have been a horizontal thing and i didn't need to do all the things that i was doing second is still crazier than this this is in pauna so this client he got 1 acre of land which is extremely long strip of when i say long means it's really long and very thin and long and that again that property on the thinner side is into two levels so you have a road level and then half of it is something like 20 25 feet is on the road level then 20 25 feet is on the lake level and there's a drop of something like 40 to 45 feet so how do you make a house on these kind of stuff you know and the second thing that is i get obsessed by when you have these kind of houses what you miss out is a garden you never get a feel of a garden you feel as if you are living in an apartment you know even though you have a bungalow it's not a bungalow per se because there's no garden garden so how do you correct this thing so what i said is and um so i told him that listen we make a house your living room is a lift okay so during the day time your living room is the roof of the living room is flat it's a garden the roof of the bedrooms is a garden the living room during the day time is on the top and your garden all around 
in the night time it goes below the bedroom level the roof of the the thing becomes a garden for the bedroom so it's like a courtyard house when it's on the top during the day time it's like a it's like a room with a view and then in the night it's a courtyard house so your bedrooms on the side and the central is a living space so you can see in the night time this is at that level this is a bedroom this becomes a courtyard